Hello and welcome to Manitowoc Ice here in the city of Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Glad to have you with us today and we're going to take a look at cool air ice machines today. So cool air made by Manitowoc Ice, a little bit of a different type of unit. And before we get into it too deep, let's just explain that a little bit. So Manitowoc Ice Machines are the number one selling ice machine in the United States and they have a lot of benefits and features and we get customers sometimes that say it's just too expensive and I'm more interested in getting ice in my bin than I am in saving energy and saving water. I just need ice in my bin for a good price. So with the same quality and reliability we produce an ice machine called the Cool Air Ice Machine. So it's like a second tier ice machine. Still just as reliable as a Manitowoc ice machine, has the same evaporator, just has less features, less energy saving, less water saving uh, on that machine, but still puts ice in the bin. That's what people want sometimes for a good price. I'm not a salesman. This is a service webcast, so I don't have to go over everything in sales. Uh, on those machines. So we'll go ahead and get started with that since 2005. And I'm an instructor here. We don't do any face-to-face -face training right now, obviously, because of COVID. So we're going to take a look at undercounter coolers like this one on my right side or your left side. And then we'll take a look at modular cooler ice machines. And when I say modular, what that means is an ice machine without storage means. So it could be on top of a soda dispenser. It could be on top of a bin on those machines. Here's some QR codes. We do have videos on our YouTube page of how to clean both those under-counter ice machines and the modular ice machine. So if you're ever like, how do we clean that ice machine? Because that's the thing I do the most. You can scan those QR codes on your phone and it'll take you right to our YouTube page and you can get details on cleaning so I don't have to go over that today. At the end of today's webcast there'll be a little bit of time for you to take a quiz. Now don't worry it's not graded, there's no pass fail rate or anything like that, but it's good to do and what it will do is reinforce what you've learned today and then you'll get a copy of the, your certification of completion of this webcast and you'll also get a copy of this presentation too so you have it for reference in the future that might take a day or two to get to you maybe it's pretty quick normally but just be patient um, and if you're expecting it to come the second that you fill that quiz in and submit it so don't forget to do that so here's my under counter cool air ice machine you can see on the front we've got a bin door up top removable grill ice off clean switch washable air filter and adjustable leveling legs on that ice machine. So we've got some adjustable six inch leveling legs on it on that unit. We're going to flip the door open and take a look inside of this ice machine. Why don't we do that right now actually because I've got one right here. So I'm just going to have Will come over and zoom in a little bit on this ice machine for me so we can take an actual live look inside the machine instead of just seeing the pictures on the screen. And I'm going to move out the way a little bit. And we'll take a look inside this ice machine. So first you can see starting at the top, we've got an ice thickness probe hanging there on the grid of that ice machine. This is a nickel covered or plated evaporator on this ice machine. We've got a damper door moving down. And I'm going to reach in there, put my light in there so you can see a little better. And you can see there is a magnet on that damper door. And as we open and close it, it opens and closes the magnetic switch on that machine. So this cylinder here, right here, this is your magnet on the damper door. And it's been updated lately, so it's more enclosed in the damper. So that way there's less chance of it breaking off to be it molded into that unit. And this this magnetic switch, it sits right up against the magnetic switch side, that little square box on the side of the evaporator 
on that machine. Now, just to the right, there is a float valve back in there. I'm going to point that out. And then we've got my water pump sitting here in the evaporator section as well. And just above the water pump, you can see that big, thick water tube going up to the top of the evaporator on that unit. Water trough is removable on this machine, so it makes it nice and easy to clean. All right, so I just wanted to show you inside for a second. So we'll come back to the desk and we'll go through some pictures on your screen of those things. So that's the under counter cool air type ice machine. Just kind of a brief overview on it. We'll scooch down in a little while and take a look at some of the refrigeration and uh, electronic components in that ice machine. Thank you, Will. So taking the front cover off, we've got a data plate underneath the front cover. We got our washable air filter. Two screws take that front cover off that machine. Down below, we've got our condenser coil. You can see our data plate there. You can see our high pressure cutout switch and our service valves in our compressor compartment. There's also a fan cycling switch down there and a hot gas valve too down there for that ice machine. Evaporator we just looked at, ice thickness probe hanging on that evaporator, damper door with a magnet on the right hand side, water trough that is removable for cleaning. And then you can see in this picture, I've still got the cover over the water pump on this one. So there's a little cover that goes over the water pump. I took it off this one already, so you'd be able to see that water pump. So if I remove it, you can see that black water pump sitting in there, a float valve. This is water float controlled. So we're not using a water inlet valve to control the water level in this ice machine. We're using a discharge hose and notice how big that discharge hose is too, right? It seems like it's massive in there and there's a good reason for that huge discharge hose in that ice machine on that water hose. It's really big on that unit. Magnetic switch and then taking a look at the data plate, you can see this is R404A refrigerant. Um, this one on the screen has 14 ounces of charge in it, so a little less than a pound on this one. They don't hold that much charge on that unit. Uh, KYF 0150-161 on the screen here, and if we break that model number down a little bit, the KYF, the F stands for the refrigerant type. So we, we like to designate the refrigerant types in our ice machines nowadays because we don't just use one refrigerant type for all the different ice machines. Uh, we use different refrigerants in different ice machines. So when the cool air modulars first came out, people got used to them having R410A refrigerant in them. They got kind of used to that now. Uh, but this under counter, it has R404A. So we don't want to confuse people and make them think that all cool airs have R410A in them. Undercounters run on R404A refrigerant types. So we took a look at some of the components on the outside of the unit and basically in the bin on that unit. We took a quick look at the compressor compartment on the screen and we'll take a look at this one in here in just a little while. And then the evaporator compartment and breaking that model number down for you. So let's take a look at how this ice machine works. Let's, let's go through a little bit of sequence here and see what's going on with it. So we've got a basic control board in there and it's got two lights on it, a green light and a red light. The green light is your bin switch or your damper switch, you could call it too, I don't mind. That when you open and close it, that green light goes on and off. The red light in here, it's, it's like a multi-function harvest light. It tells you when you're in harvest, but it also blinks like a turn signal when something goes wrong on the unit. And to find out what service limit it tripped off on, you have to turn the ice machine off and then turn it back to ice and count how many times that light blinks on you to see if it's a, a service limit one or a service limit two on that ice machine. 
So it's a little quick look at my control board here. It's programmed to do what it's supposed to do and what the inputs tell it to do. Inputs are things like the ice off clean toggle switch. So we've got an ice off clean or ice off wash toggle switch on that ice machine. A lot of, you know, a lot of under counters, they don't even have clean cycles. You just have to make ice cubes out of um, ice machine cleaner. But this one does. This one has a, a fully integrated clean system in the programming of that control board. So it will circulate cleaner through it and dump the cleaner out and circulate it. We have a bin switch, or you could call it a damper switch. The one on the screen, a little bit of an older version where you can actually see the black disc magnet. Make sure in the real world, make sure that black disc didn't break off, okay? I see, I used to go to a lot of service calls on these machines and they would run in a clean cycle, but they wouldn't run in ice. So I knew they had power on them. I'm like, why won't it run in ice? First thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my eyes and look to see if that black disc magnet is on that damper door or if it broke off and it's missing. So take a good look at that black magnet right there. It's nice and big. It's like the size of a nickel. Uh, it's thick. When it breaks off, it leaves like a little black shaft behind. And some people think that's the magnet, the little black pencil lead shaft almost, but it's not. It needs to be that nice big disc right there. And you can kind of see that square rectangular box that it leans up on. And just to the top of it, there's a little square hole in it. And you poke something in that square hole and that'll release it from the evaporator. And then you can pull it towards you and you'll see the wires. Sometimes people think that bin switch is, is part of the evaporator and it can't be taken off it, but it can. And I, I've even had customers call in and say, they say I need to replace my whole evaporator because my bin switch failed, which is not the case. They were, they were pretty upset at that point. Here's my ice thickness probe. This is my ice thickness probe, sits on the evaporator has one adjustment screw on it. And again, it's basically just a piece of metal connected to a piece of wire. It's got a piece of wire soldered to it and that's it. There's no fancy electronic trickery in there or anything like that. Just a piece of wire soldered onto a metal T piece on that grid with one adjustment screw on it. And you'll notice nowadays they're they're a gray color in these machines to make it nice and match with everything else. They used to be white. If you had a white one, it would work on there. It would just, you know, not match the colors. It would be exactly the same uh, on those machines. So that's the ice thickness probe on there. So no fancy acoustic uh, ice thickness probe. We're going to keep this machine real basic um, on those units. So outputs, we got a contact coil that fires up my compressor. We got some fan cycling switches and we got a high pressure switch. So fan cycle and a high pressure switch right next to each other. We are gonna put this ice machine into ice position to get it started up on you. So I'm gonna turn the ice machine from on to ice on this machine. So I'm gonna turn it to ice and I'm gonna equalize my pressures with a hot gas solenoid valve. Um, let will show you what a hot gas solenoid valve looks like on the camera. So I can have Will take a look at this hot gas solenoid valve in just a second. This is one out of a different machine, a little bit bigger, a little bit easier for you to see. And this happens to be a right angled valve. It could be a straight through valve on this machine. Sometimes we use straight through, sometimes we use right angled valves. Thanks, Will, but it's just a solenoid coil that sits on top of a valve. And when you get power to these terminals on top of it, it's going to electrically magnetize the coil and that's going to pull a plunger up inside the valve and it's going to open the valve. So hot gas solenoid valves are powered to open on our ice machines. Typically in the refrigeration industry, they're always powered to open. There was one weird job I found where you they were powered to close on one uh, warehouse uh, refrigerated 
I worked on. And that took me a while to work out what was going on with that one. But 99% of the time, hot gas valves are powered to open. While I've got you zoomed in, um, I also wanted to show you the ice thickness probe real quick. So here's my ice thickness probe, a nice zoom on it. And you can see there's an adjustment screw on it right here, uh, right here. Yeah, thank you, Will. And as you turn it clockwise, that makes the ice probe move further away from the grid and that'll make your ice thicker. So if you turn it counterclockwise, obviously it'll get closer to the grid. That'll make your ice thinner. This little metal part down here, this T part, you know, we call it an ice thickness probe, but it doesn't actually know the difference between water and ice. It doesn't know the difference. So when water comes down the evaporator and it splashes on it, you'll see the red light blink. And when water is running over the top of the ice constantly and it's touching this ice nonstop for seven seconds, that will put it into harvest. So this is my ice thickness probe on this under counter ice machine. Okay, thanks, Will. I'm gonna switch back to the slides in just a second here so you can see these as I go through them. And we'll talk next about the startup. So my hot gas valve is energized. My compressor comes on. Why would we do that? <laughs> that seems like a waste of time. Well, when the hot gas valve is energized or open with refrigerant bypassing the system, you could call it. So the high side and low side are equalized and my compressor is not doing any work. It's just running. So by holding the hot gas valve open, my compressor is just running with no load on it. And this gives my compressor a nice, easy start on it. So a nice, easy start makes my compressor last a lot longer. So then I've got into a pre-chill cycle. So I'm going to de-energize or take power away from my hot gas valve. But my contact is still running, which makes my compressor run. And then my condenser fan motor may come on with the fan cycle switch. Once the head pressure comes up to the fan cycle switch limits, it's gonna turn my fan on. So it's gonna cycle on and off possibly at this point, depending on my head pressure. Pre-chill, what is a pre-chill for? Well, pre-chill is basically where we put refrigerant through the evaporator and make the evaporator nice and cold, but we don't put any water over it yet. So we're gonna pre-chill the evaporator. And again, why would we pre-chill an evaporator? What's the difference? Well, it's to prevent slush in the water trough. And undercounters are particularly at risk from slush because the evaporators are so close to the front of the machine and people leave the bin doors open all the time. They're not supposed to, but they do. Um, and you get a lot of warm air hitting that evaporator. So you don't want slush in your water trough. This is when you get a mixture of water and ice in your water trough and it blocks up your water pump. We don't want our pump blocked up. We can't move any water and that's gonna prevent us from making ice. So we do a pre-chill for 30 seconds. Control board is controlling this 30 second pre-chill. Then we're into a freeze cycle and basically all that is, is we're gonna turn the water pump on now. We're gonna start trickling water down that evaporator on that ice machine making ice. So down comes the water over that evaporator, turn into ice after about 15 minutes, and then eventually it gets thick enough to where the water running over the top of the ice is touching the ice probe nonstop for seven seconds, and that's gonna trigger a harvest on our control board. Size of the ice, very important. We're looking for about an eighth of an inch bridge thickness on the ice. We're only interested in the bridge thickness. A lot of people get obsessed or paranoid about the dimples in the cubes you know can, can you put your finger in the dimple that kind of stuff we just care about the thickness of the bridge which is the part of the ice that connects the cubes together we're looking for an eighth inch bridge thickness there so to get that we're going to look for about three sixteenths to five sixteenths gap between the ice probe and the evaporator grid so we're looking for about a gap there, 3 16 to 5 16 gap on that machine. All right, now we had water touch our ice probe nonstop seven seconds, it went into a harvest cycle. Basically the only thing that really changed is the hot gas valve opened and it shot hot gas into our evaporator. 
We get a nice red light on here, letting us know we're in a harvest cycle on that ice machine as this hot gas valve stays open. And we're waiting for the ice to drop uh, on that ice machine. Meanwhile, something very interesting here, because we don't use a dump valve in this system, we use something called a siphon system, which all old ice machines used to use, and it still works good. So notice how big that bladder is <laughs> on the discharge hose of the water pump. So when the water pump turns off in harvest, all the water falls right out that big massive tube right there and back into the water trough. And what that does is it overflows the siphon system. So there's a siphon cap on the siphon tube and as the water comes back in the water trough, it, it flies in there really fast and it goes over the top of the siphon tube and it sucks all the water out of the water trough and down the drain till there's none left in it. Crazy, right? <laughs> you know, and then they all used to be like that uh, back a while ago using a siphon system. Uh, so it's important our drains clear and we're siphoning properly on that machine. So we drop ice. We're waiting for that damper to go open closed like that as it drops ice. And then we go back to a pre-chill and start the whole thing all over again. So we go round and round a little circle like this all day long on a pre-chill and then from pre-chill to harvest. And then one day or one hour in the day, maybe our bin gets full and then the damper gets stuck open because the ice has got nowhere to go anymore. And that turns us off on a full bin. So the damper being stuck open for 30 seconds turns us off on a full bin. So we don't have any bin thermostats hanging in the bin. We don't really like that typically because people get in there with their scoops and they bang around in there and they break off that bin thermostat. So we like to use this magnetic switch with a magnet on our damper. So it serves two purposes, right? One, it tells us that we dropped ice, go back to a freeze. Two, if it stays open for 30 seconds in a harvest, it tells us to go off on a full bin. All right, refrigeration system, pretty simple system here. And I'm gonna have Will come over again and just take a look at this refrigeration system for me. I'm gonna stand over here to the left so you can see it. So all I did here was take the front panel off this ice machine. Two screws, I took the front panel off. Uh, I, the filter is out the way of the condenser now. Um, and I can get to my compressor. I can get to my refrigeration service valves right here. I took the panel off here for my electrical and I can get to the contactor. This is not plugged in right now, so I'm not touching anything live right now. And I can see my control board in here too. That has my two little lights on it uh, that tell me uh, I've got a green one and a red one come on it. And I've also got my ice off clean switch here at the bottom of that control panel. So nice and easy to get to on this one. Refrigeration access ports all there. Remember, it doesn't hold very much refrigerant in that system uh, on that unit. Easy to clean the condenser if it got all greasy or something like that. But a good way to get to this ice machine system. Let me just grab the filter. And the filter would normally slide up into the case. I'm sorry, slide up into the case that's on the front of it and cover this condenser. Uh, but you know, sometimes grease will get through a filter like this. So maybe you'd have to degrease it or something like that if it was in a greasy environment. Oh, that, oh, sideways, right? So I'm sorry. From the bottom, I'm thinking of Neo. It comes in through the side like this when the cover's on and covers that condenser. Thanks, Will. All right, back to the screen. We've got a real simple refrigeration system, a TXV valve, a hot gas valve, a condenser, an evaporator. Um, the big thing to note here is the only difference between freeze and harvest on refrigeration is that hot gas valve getting energized. That's it. That's the only difference. I mean, you take away the water system and everything like that. This is the only difference. So I'm going to energize that hot gas solenoid valve on that ice machine. 
and we're going to go into a harvest cycle on that ice machine. That's really the only difference in there on that machine. All right, so we reviewed some sequence of operation so you know what's going on and when it's supposed to go on. Pre-chill, you know what that's for now, to get that evaporator nice and cold before we put water over it so we don't get a big slush mix up. Uh, we talked about the operation of that ice probe and how they can see ice or water. They don't know the difference. Another big thing with those ice probes is they don't know the difference not only between ice and water, but slime and scale. If it gets slime and scale on it, it thinks it's touching ice, and that'll put it into a premature harvest. So if you go up to one of these machines and it seems like it's going into harvest right at six minutes, look at that ice probe. Maybe even disconnect it from the board and run it for like 15 minutes and see if your premature harvest goes away. If it does go away, you know it's a problem with that ice thickness probe then. All right, we got about halfway through there. And we're finished up with under counter ice machines. So now we're going to take a look at the modular cool air ice machine. So this is a, again, this is a, an ice machine. We don't know if it's going on a bin or a beverage system. We don't know. Or it could even go on a hotel dispenser. We don't know. So it's an ice machine without storage means. Cool air have their own bins too. And you can see that they have a stainless steel looking front on them. It's actually something called Duratec. And the sides are just black painted, right? Talking to customers, we would say, hey, to reduce the cost for you, what if it wasn't stainless steel looking? Would you, would you be okay with that? And they're like, oh, we really like the stainless steel look in our kitchen. And we're like, well, we're looking for ways to reduce cost for you. What if we make the sides black on it? And they're like, no, that's fine. The black sides will be fine as long as the front is um, stainless steel looking on that ice machine. It'll be a good way to go. So that's what we did on the cooler. So that's why they have black sides and a, on the bins and the ice machines. Model number, this is a KYT 500. You know, they used to not have that third letter on the front three letters, but again, we want to designate the refrigerant type on those ice machines now. So we went from having like a KD500 to a KDT500 type ice machine for different size ice on those machines. 500 pounder, that's what the 500 means, 524 hour period. Air cooled, these are available in water cooled. Uh, 261 on these ice machines too. Well, on this one, 261. But you can get 115 volts. You can get 230 volts on these ice machines. You can get the bigger ones in remote. I'll show you that too. You can get them with remotes where the condensers outside, but you cannot get them in quiet cube versions, you know, like a CVD where the compressor's outside. Only the condenser coil and fan goes outside on those cool air ice machines. If, if somebody was going to go to the expense of buying a quiet cube, because quiet cubes are always more expensive, uh, they may as well just get a Manitowoc Indigo if that's if that's the price they're looking at. So it doesn't make sense to make one in quiet cube version. Water curtain on this ice machine. You know, why don't I take this apart a little bit and then we'll go back to the pictures and that'll be kind of a reinforcement. So I'll take it apart live a little bit so you can see it. Why don't we do that? And then we'll go back to the screen in a second. So I'm gonna have Will uh, take a look at this cooler ice machine for me as I pull it apart. I'm gonna try and stay out the way a little bit so you can see what's going on. So if it looks like I'm being awkward, I kind of am because I don't wanna just stand in front of it and take all the components or take some of the components out of it so you can see what's going on. So, you know, this might look familiar to you. If you've worked on Manitowoc for a long time, this might look like an S series ice machine to you, but it is a little different. There are some differences in it and I will show you. So I'm gonna take the water curtain off first. I've already taken the front panel off, which is just two screws. I'm going to take the water curtain off first, so I'm just going to grab my water curtain here in the middle and flex it on one side. 
and pop one side out and then take the curtain out the way. Same curtain as a Manitowoc indigo ice machine, right? So the supply house has to carry less parts. They don't have to carry, you know, parts for cool air, parts for indigo, Manitowoc, and we try and integrate them together because my parts supplier does not want to carry a whole ton of parts. All right, so curtains out of the way, you can see this beautiful evaporator. It is the same exact evaporator as in a Manitowoc ice machine. So there's no, you know, cheaping out on materials or anything crazy like that on it. It's a copper evaporator to the core and it's nickel coated or nickel plated evaporator on this ice machine. I'm gonna take the water trough out now. So I'm gonna pull these two thumb tabs in towards the middle. And sometimes I cross my arms to do this. It makes it a little bit easier. And then I'm gonna pull the water trough out towards you and take it away from the machine. So I can take that back to the sink nice and easily um, and clean it up, makes it nice and easy for me. Notice that there is uh, water floats down here. There are water float switches down here. I think, yeah, Will's got those in picture for me because they control the thickness of the ice and when the ice machine goes into harvest. So this ice machine doesn't have any kind of ice thickness probe hanging on the grid. Uh, I'll just pull, I'll just pull them out. So they pull straight down into the machine. And as I pull the cord down, a connector will come through and I'll undo the connector. There you go, undid the connector. I even did it, oh, let me get my hand out of the way so you can see it. I even managed to do it with one hand. <laughs> so you can see that the water float switch comes out the way, comes out the machine nice and easily. I'm just gonna put that out of the way. And if I wanna do the other one, I could do that too. Just gonna grab it right here. It kind of wiggles about a little bit. And then I'm gonna pull it straight down into the machine. And then I undo the connector and then my float comes out of there. And maybe, why would I take these out? Maybe to test them, maybe to clean them if they're really nasty and they've got a bunch of slime all over them and stuff like that. Uh, and then I'm gonna take those back to the sink to clean them out. So I'm gonna have Will go to the top a little bit here to the water distribution tube because this confuses people somewhere. Notice that there's a little hanger for an ice probe there. That's weird. <laughs> a lot of times when technicians see this for the first time, they're like, well, here's your problem, sir. Somebody stole your ice thickness probe, but they don't have one. They use the same water distribution part number or part as Manitowoc ice machines. So why would we, you know, we want to keep it to just one part to make it easier for the supply house but notice no ice probe hanging up there on this distribution grid. And I could take this out for you if you'd like. I could just undo these two screws, one on each side, they just loosen up and they don't have to come out all the way. And then I can slide this distribution tube towards me and it comes apart in two sections. So there's the front section and I'm just gonna move that out the way for a second. And then I can take these two tabs and wiggle this part of the distribution tube out. Right, and then I can see there's a there's some O-rings holding it in here. I'm just gonna hold that still so you can see them. You wanna make sure those O-rings are in good shape. They're not rolled over or broken or anything like that. And then I can take the two parts of my distribution tube to the sink to be cleaned. Let me just show you which I think is really cool. <laughs> At Manitowoc, we don't like to make you buy special brushes or anything like that to clean machines. We want you to be able to clean it with everyday stuff that you'd have on your truck or you'd find in a kitchen. So I'll put this distribution tube back together for you. And you can see the holes on it now where the water comes out, right? So some manufacturers, you might have to buy like a special brush or have something nice and special to clean. Man, what a good shot that one is of those holes. So with ours, you just split it apart. I'm gonna do that. 
And then you can take it back to the sink and it makes it nice and easy to clean. No special brushes or anything like that to clean it on that unit. All right, I'm going to go ahead and put this distribution tube out the way as well. And put this to the side. And then while I'm over here, I'll have Will have you take a look at that control box too. And we'll start at the top here with the refrigeration access ports. So, you know, some people are like, oh, if it costs less, maybe I won't be able to put my gauges on it because they they didn't put refrigeration access ports on it. But there are there are two refrigeration access ports right on this cool air ice machine. And then moving down just a little bit, you can see this control board which is actually the same control board as in a Neo ice machine. So that way, again, our distributors have to stock less parts, but it works in a different way than the Neo, which is pretty, pretty smart. It's got two programs in there, one for the Neo, one for the cool air, and it knows it's in a cool air by the way the toggle switch is plugged into it. You have an ice off clean toggle switch, and when the board senses that, it says, oh, I'm in a cool air, and then it goes into its cool air program. Very cool. This is all, there's no power to this, by the way, so I'm not touching anything live, nothing like that. You don't want to see me get lit up again. <laughs> uh, there's a PTCR in here. So right on here, this black item right here, this is a PTCR or a positive temperature coefficient resistor. I'm going to grab my light here just in case you're having trouble seeing that a little bit. Yeah, that seems to light it up a little bit. So PTCR in here, and then down lower, I've got my run capacitor. I don't need a start capacitor because my hot gas valve opens and equalizes the pressures. I got my contactor, and then I've got my ice off clean toggle switch right here. Ice off clean toggle switch. Just a quick tip on this toggle switch for people. If a toggle switch is failing, you know, a lot of people like to take them out and ohm them out and everything like that. What I like to do is just jump it out. So I just move these little red terminals halfway off the switch and then I'll jump from the common, which is the middle, obviously, to the ice, which is the red one, and I'll jump it in that position. And then if all my problems disappear, if it stops mysteriously going on and off and stuff like that, I know it's a toggle switch problem. So you've got a white, black, red. The way I remember it is the black is the clean wire because black is kind of dirty, maybe. I don't know. That's how I remember it. And then the red is the freeze. And I just think, well, red is the opposite to blue or cold. And that, that's how I remember it. It's kind of weird. <laughs> I know red is the opposite to freeze. So that's just how I remember it. But the black, if I can remember the black is the clean uh, wire, then I'm in good shape, right? All right, we can move back to the uh, screen now. Thanks again, Will. I appreciate you uh, taking time to uh, do about 15 things at once today. <laughs> so we're going to take a look at uh, the, the screen now so that you can see uh, a little enforcement of what I just took, what I just did. So I took off the water curtain. I looked at my evaporator, nice and shiny. I noticed there's refrigeration access valves. I noticed there's float switches, two of them, a water trough control box and a toggle switch, an ice off clean switch on that machine. Evaporator copper coated. Um, and then, I'm sorry, a copper evaporator coated in nickel. And then you've got this new little tag on here that says don't charge liquid through the high side valve because it can cause damage. These have rotary compressors in them. And we found out that if you pull your machine on a good vacuum, that if you dump liquid into the high side, which you could do on a, on a reciprocating compressor because it would just fill up the condenser, um, on a rotary compressor, you can get in trouble. You can actually get liquid into the compressor and then it starts up and it fails right away. So we don't want to do that. So what we do instead is we use a liquid line filter dryer with an access port on it. So if you have to charge up an empty system and you pull the vacuum on it, you can dump your liquid right in that liquid line uh, filter dryer on that machine. Um, if there isn't one, 
if it's a really old cooler and there isn't one, you can go ahead and install a, an access process tube on the liquid line, or you can just buy a new filter dryer because you probably have the system open anyway. And our filter dryers will have access ports on them now for that reason. 410A refrigerant access valves control board. We saw that. A compressor run cap on this one. Contactor on this ice machine. On off clean toggle switch on this ice machine at the bottom. And then we got a water pump. We got a harvest float switch and an ice thickness float switch. So two dedicated float switches, one to put the ice machine in harvest and one for the thickness of the ice. I'll show you how that works. So one float switch is adjustable. The left one, as you're looking into the machine, has a little adjustment nut on it. And you can raise the float up with that adjustment nut. If you turn it to the right, then the float gets higher on that adjustment nut and that makes your ice thicker. Turn it to the left, float gets lower, that makes your ice thinner. And again, we're looking for an eighth of an inch bridge thickness. That's always kind of our magic bridge thickness on our ice machines. So one's adjustable, one isn't on that ice machine. Right side, we got a heat exchanger, a high pressure cutout, discharge manifold, um, water inlet valve. So this uses a water inlet valve and it uses a dump valve on this system as well. Left side, water pump discharge hose, TXV, evaporator. This one's a water-cooled unit, so you can see there's a water-cooled condenser in there. Maybe you don't get a chance to see water cools too often these days. You know, we used to sell like 50-50 water-cooled, air-cooled back in the 90s, but not anymore. Now it's like 10% water-cooled maybe because the government and the planet don't want you using too much water going straight down the drain. Not good for the environment, right? But... Rear water cooled connections down here. We got water inlet, water outlet for the drain. And then we got water inlet, water outlet for the water cooled condenser. Here's an air cooled ice machine with a filter sitting on the back of it, an air filter for that condenser. And here is a remote unit. So this is a remote unit with pink caps on it to make sure that you know it's 410A. Nowadays, you might be like, why are they making such a big deal out of 410A? Well. When this came out, everything we had was 404A in these big machines. So we wanted to make it very clear that this 410A, that this cool air was a 410A refrigerant so that installers wouldn't just assume it's 404A like all the rest of our ice machines. So we put colored caps on there. We said charged with 410A only. And we put that sticker on there. <laughs> Actually, I get to take some credit for that. I, when they when they asked me for changes in engineering i'm like well, can we please put a sticker on the refrigeration connections and they're like well why isn't it obvious i'm like at least once a year somebody hooks water up to those refrigeration connections and we ruin a whole ice machine and they're like but how you can't connect water to these these uh, quick connects and they managed to find a way the the plumber manages to find enough adapters to make it work somehow so we don't want to do that. So we looked at basically the outside of this unit and the inside. We went over some components. We looked at our control box a little bit uh, on that machine. Now let's take a look at some sequence, okay? Remember, no ice probe in this machine, no ice probe. So we got two floats that control it. Very easy, very simple. We have a harvest float switch that puts it into harvest. And we have an ice thickness float that um, you can adjust up and down, raise it up and down on that machine. Control system, we have inputs and outputs on this control system. The green ones are inputs, the red ones are outputs. That's typically how our boards go to. When you see a green light, it's an input. When you see a red light, it's an output on that ice machine. So the LEDs work the same way on the board of that machine. Here is that control board. Like I was saying, it's pretty smart. It's actually the same control board as is used in the Neo Ice machine, but the little undercounter Neo Ice machine uses a different sequence of operation. And I would say, well, how does it know which one it's in? Do I have to, do I have to flip a, a pesky dip switch or something or dial something that's so annoying, right? Nope, it knows automatically. It looks at the harness that's plugged into it from the on-off switch and it knows if it's in a cool air 
or if it's in a Neo ice machine. You can see that blue test button on the board too. This test button will energize all your relays nonstop uh, on that board for three minutes to make it nice and easy to test that ice machine. So I'm going to turn this ice machine on. I'm going to turn it to the ice position. And I got to make sure my curtain is on and in place. If my curtain's in the back room because they're washing it, I'm not going to have much luck getting this ice machine running. And I'm going to start my unit up. My water pump's going to come on. My dump valve is going to come on. Just for a second, we're going to talk about a dump valve here. And I'm going to have the camera zoom up on this dump valve. We use a lot of dump valves here at Manitowoc Ice, and this is a typical dump valve for us. Uh, a Manitowoc ice. Uh, this one's got a red coil on it. Sometimes they have blue coils on them. Sometimes the red coil meant it was 230 volts and the blue was 115, but we've changed manufacturers, so don't rely on that all the time. Um, and I wanted to show you, if a dump valves fail, they do fail. They get a lot of crusty, nasty water in them and they'll fail eventually. Uh, and if they do, you just replace them, right? But if you're there on a Saturday or something, well, what do you do? If you can't get a dump valve, instead of instead of just saying you got to wait till Monday, you can actually take this thing apart. So I'm going to take it apart a little bit. I took it out of the machine. I took the connectors off. I took the power off it, uh, and then I just took the 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 screws that mount it. And then what you can do is you just give it a twist counterclockwise on the top. So I hold the bottom of the valve, and I hold the top of the valve, and then I just twist it counterclockwise, and it clicks. And then the dump valve comes apart. Inside the dump valve, I find my plunger with a little spring on it that goes in my coil. Let's sit, so the spring sits up in here with my little plunger. And this is what goes up and down, right? So the spring holds it down. And when it gets energized, it pulls this up and opens the dump valve. And then I get my little gasket or bladder whatever you would like to call it. And it sits in here and this is what makes the dump valve work. So maybe if it's not working, you could pull this apart. And if it's got like a bunch of scale on it, you could kind of wash it off or break it off and you might be able to get it back in business. Now you could see this one's damaged, right? I had this one leak uh, and there's a little nick out of that um, bladder part on it. So that's why this one's not working because the bladder's nicked. But if it's kind of crusty, maybe you can pull it apart and get it back in shape. You might not get it to work again. There's there's like a 50% chance maybe that you'll get it to work again by doing it. But it's so easy to do that it's worth giving it a shot. So I'm just going to put the bladder back in and then I'm going to put the uh, cylinder or the follower back in and then I'm going to push it together and then I'm going to turn it a quarter and then my dump valve's back together, right? So maybe you can clean it out and get it back in business until you can get a new one for a few days on a dump valve. So I just wanted to show you the dump valve real quick. And why I have you zoomed in, I'm going to show you that filter dryer I was talking about as well. So here's that filter dryer that comes on a cooler ice machine. And you can see it's got an access port on it. So now when you go buy a Manitowoc filter dryer, even if it's not for a cool air ice machine, uh, it's probably going to have an access port on it. And you might be like, wonder why they changed that? Uh, because of rotary compressors, it makes them easier to charge through the liquid line that way. So that's one way we did it. So this is our new filter dryer, fairly new. It's been around about two years maybe. Uh, on that ice machine. All right, so I wanted to show you that. Thanks for um, bearing with me and we'll switch back to the we'll switch back to the screen so you can see some of that sequence. But, you know, some of you might be really familiar with a sequence, so it's nice to to do things. So dump valves open, water pumps on, we get rid of all the nasty water. There's a five second delay and then our hot gas valve opens again. It equalizes the pressure. Look at that pressure equalizing as that hot gas valve opens. So if there was a pressure difference, now they're equal. Then we're going to start our compressor. Hot gas valve still open. So it, it's kind of split my high side and low side in half on that machine. 
So I'm just running with no pressure on my compressor. There's no work for it to do. That makes my compressor last a long time. If I can get it up to 100% speed with no work and then introduce work to it, my compressor is going to have a longer life. So then I de-energize my hot gas valve. I take power away from it. My evaporator gets cold. My condenser gets hot. I start making ice. Back here in the, fl in the water trough, water's coming in from my water inlet valve. And my control board is watching that ice thickness float switch on it. So I'm in a free cycle. My contact is in. My compressor's running. My water pump's on. My little yellow water inlet valve there is filling up my water trough. And my control board's watching this ice float switch here. So we're watching it, watching it, adding water to it. As the water goes up, the ice thickness float maxes out, turns my water off. If it hasn't seen that happen within six minutes, it's going to turn my water off automatically, okay? And then we're going to use a batch system. So look at this water in this water trough. It's exactly enough water to make one batch of ice. So why put more water in a water trough? I'm just going to slow down my freeze cycle. I have exactly enough water in here to make one batch of ice. I'm going to shoot 12 seconds of water in to prevent slush in my water trough. I don't need it, but just in case there's slush in my water trough at this point, I'm gonna shoot 12 seconds of water in just in case there's any slush left in there. That'll melt it out. Then I made ice. This water vanished. Where did it go? It turned to ice on the evaporator. And as it all vanished, my harvest float drops out and this starts my harvest cycle, right? So if I, if I wanted to force a harvest cycle on, I'd have to wait six minutes into a freeze cycle because it doesn't look at the harvest valve until six minutes. And then I could push my harvest valve down and hold it down for about five seconds. And that would make it go into a harvest cycle. So that's what's forcing it into a harvest cycle. Energize my hot gas valve. Hot gas goes into my evaporator, drops ice off the grid. Uh, curtain switches swings open and closed as it drops ice and then I go back to my pre-chill for another cycle. Eventually fill up with ice. Ice has got nowhere to go. Curtain gets stuck open on ice. It's open for 30 seconds. I go off on a full bin and I'm not allowed to come back on until at least three minutes is expired on that machine for a start back up. Okay so again curtains doing two jobs. One, it's watching for ice to drop. Two, it's shutting me off on a full bin on that machine. We did update the cool air. We kind of brought it in line with an Indigo Next just because we made updates to Indigo Next. Like we reduced the maximum freeze time to 35 minutes. And the cool air was still on 60 minutes from, you know, just a carryover. And we're like, let's just make it the same so people get used to it. We don't need a 60 minute max freeze cycle. If something goes wrong, after 35 minutes, there's going to be a problem. We don't need 60. So now we have a max three cycle of 35 minutes. A max harvest time of seven minutes is new on the cool air. And a water assist, just like a Manitowoc Indigo Next. It has a water assist in the harvest cycle. If something's not going right after three and a half minutes, we're going to try and help it out to get that ice off the grid. You know, on a normal clean ice machine, you should drop ice in a harvest cycle in less than two minutes. I've seen them drop in 50 seconds in a harvest cycle. But if something's gone wrong, it's really nasty, dirty or something, we're going to try and help the ice fall off that grid. All right, refrigeration. We have got a rotary compressor in a lot of these cool air ice machines. Not all of them. Some of the big ones have reciprocating, but we got a rotary compressor in this ice machine. Evaporator, access valves, warning labels up on this unit as well. Just a reminder, don't use charging liquid in the high side. Charge liquid through the dryer if you pulled a good vacuum on that machine. So we got a good vacuum on that machine on that uh, unit. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I read something the other day that... Um, and I don't blame them. Sometimes new technicians, they don't know why they do things that they do because there's just so much to learn when you're new that you just kind of do it because you're told to do it. Uh, but this technician was like 15 years into the industry and 
asked him we asked him about what he what a vac pump does and he literally thought it just if you didn't pull a vac pump if you didn't use a vac pump it couldn't pull refrigerant into the system that was the only reason for it you had to put a you had to vacuum everything out of the system so that it would pull refrigerant into the system and that was the only reason for a vac pump Vac pumps are there to get moisture out of those lines on the refrigeration system. Moisture is not good for refrigerant. So the vac pump literally boils moisture out those refrigerant lines by pulling it into a deep vacuum on that system. We go into a harvest cycle. We energize the hot gas harvest valve, shoot hot gas into that evaporator, make the ice fall off the grid. Remote, a remote unit has a HBR system. If you want to find out more about how harvest pressure regulating systems work, come to my traditional remote troubleshooting webcast. Come to one of those or go watch one of them. I don't have enough time to get into it today, but it has a harvest pressure regulating system on that. Yeah, we got about five minutes to go, so hang in there with me. I'm nearly there. Don't worry. Uh, because on remotes, there's a lot of check valves in the system. This is to stop refrigerant return into the compressor when it's in an off cycle. And there are other reasons for it too. But because there's check valves, if you only recover refrigerant from, you know, the, the one side of a check valve, you're going to get refrigerant trapped in the system that you didn't know about. We don't want that to happen. So we have something called a four point recovery. High side, low side, liquid line. Look how nice we are. We even put a liquid line up top there for you, right next to the high side and low side, the shorter one to make it easier for you to recover. You're not, you're not scratching around in the back of that ice machine trying to get on a king valve or anything like that. And then a Schrader coming out the back of the ice machine. There is two lines. Um, a discharge line and a liquid line on the discharge line just connect to that Schrader and pull from all four of those points at the same time. This will make it easy for you. You didn't have to drag your recovery up to the roof. That was the whole idea. We didn't want you to drag that heavy recovery up to the roof. If you didn't have to, you can pull on all four of those points. So we looked at an overview. We looked at some refrigeration systems on there on that ice machine. We looked at some floats, some float switches. You know, don't make don't make your life complicated. Go in there, move the floats up and down. See if the green light on the board goes on and off when you move the float up and down. Right? People are always like, "Well, I ohmed it out, and I got this many ohms, and all that stuff." I'm like, just move it up and down and see if the green light goes on and off. It should. Both those floats have their own green lights on the board. Move them up and down. Online training is available 24 seven. If you can't sleep at three in the morning and you're looking for something to do, you can take our online website training on cool air ice machines and indigo ice machines. You can find our videos on YouTube as well for cleaning our ice machines as well. Monthly webcasts, sign up for those. Uh, online video training, uh, look at that. Cleaning an ice machine. See, I do do some work sometimes. <laughs> You can see me putting cleaner into that cool air ice machine. You can go see videos about that uh, and we'll go through it step by step with you uh, and show you how to clean an undercounter and a modular ice machine on that unit. So thanks for joining us today. It's time for you to take your quiz. So you can either scan this with your phone. You can scan that with your phone and it'll take you right into the questions or you can click on the link that's in the Q&A section that Will has put up for me. Thanks to him for doing all the hard work behind the scenes. And go ahead and take it and you'll get a certificate of completion. Why not get a certificate for coming and spending an hour with me, right? Have something to show for it uh, after you've done that quiz. And again, don't worry, it's not a, it's not a pass fail quiz. If you get three wrong, or five wrong, you take the quiz again. You know, you can take as many times as you want. But go in there and do it and make sure you hit submit with the email that you want this certificate of completion sent to. You know, if we were in person, I could hand you a certificate and shake your hand. But those days just aren't on anymore. So thanks again for joining me, Jonathan Bailey, here in Manitowoc, Wisconsin at our Manitowoc Ice Training Facility. I'll see you again on the next webcast or virtual training. Goodbye from me.